Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Pleasant Hill Baptist Church to the Sunday School Hour. And if you're joining us on the streaming video this morning, hope you get a blessing out of it today. We're in a new era right now, as most of you are, are aware. Uh, the coronavirus has got us doing some social distancing, and hopefully we're spending some time on our knees as well in prayer and scripture reading. The, uh, I guess the public announcement part of this is if you have television, radio, please abide by what the, uh, the Center for Disease Control, CDC, is telling us. Social distancing, trying to stay uh, six foot away from people, staying inside if you're sick. Don't go out if you don't have to. A minimum of 20 seconds washing your hands and try to keep your hands away from your face uh, to slow down the germs. But many would say that this is a, a fearful time, uh, a chaotic time, but I would challenge you that it's a time to slow down a little bit, return to your first love, get in the Bible, and really study. Study about God's Word. Normally we'd do some birthdays, some anniversaries, um, do some prayer requests, and praise reports. And we'll leave that for Brother Danny in the worship hour. And uh, go ahead and get on with the lesson. And, and I'd like to say to my Sunday school class, I really miss you guys. We didn't have church, of course, last Sunday, a corporate worship. And uh, so my heart goes out to you. If there's anything I can do for you, I think most of you got my phone number. You can get me through the church directory. Let me know if there's any way I could help you. I'd, I'd love to help you. This morning, I wanted to, for the lesson, I wanted to go back to the lesson that was planned for last week because I think it's got a lot of meaning. I'm going to plug Brother Danny on Wednesday nights. He's been going through the book of Galatians. And Galatians is the predominant book of the Bible that talks about that we're no longer under the law. We have liberty from the law. And it also talks about that we have salvation through Christ Jesus. And so in our Sunday school lessons, we've been looking at Unpacking the language of faith. Last week, as I mentioned, salvation was to be the topic. That's what I wanted to talk about today. We're three weeks away from Easter. Salvation is what we pin our hope and future on. If it weren't for salvation, we'd all be undone in our sins. And so this morning we will get into it. But as we think about the coronavirus and you know, everybody's struggling to be saved. What does that word save? What is salvation? What does it really mean? Lots of times when we're on our computer, we save a document. You know, it stores it for a future need. Or we may save a letter or a bill. Maybe save our leftovers for a, another time to come back and, and enjoy that, that meal. Or maybe we save something on a DVR. There's a lot of different things that save means, but it, it means that something is protected from harm or loss so that you can use it later or enjoy it. Something is saved today for a future opportunity. And I want you to know as we start this lesson, God saves people, but he doesn't use software, airtight containers, or electronics to do it. Neither does he use the law. The law is powerless to save, and we're going to talk about this this morning. But God gave the law for a different purpose, to show humans their need for salvation. So as we're trying to explain some of these words that if you, you weren't churched growing up, sometimes people, when they come into a church atmosphere, they feel a little um, anxious because some of these words are a little bit bigger, or maybe they don't understand the true meaning. And so it gives them reason to pause. But I want to use another word, testimony, and give you some examples from my life to help you understand a little bit about save. Testimony is just that it's an experience. It's something that you have had firsthand uh, occasion to witness. And so I want to share you two saving conditions that happened in my life. My father was 59 when I was born. Now, I'm 56 right now and trying to run 
the um, grandbabies around, it's pretty tiring. I couldn't imagine being three years older and having a newborn. But my dad was a furniture worker, and uh, I was seven years old, and as normal, we'd get off, dad would get off work, and we would take a week at Carolina Beach. This is early 1970s, much different than Carolina Beach now. You could go to Carolina Beach, and you may or may not see anybody that whole week. There were no other kids to play with or any of that kind of stuff. And so there, and six in my family, but there was 14 between me and my closest siblings, so they had already left the house. But this had been a ritual in our house for a long time that we all go to Carolina Beach, and that was our summer vacation one week. So here my dad, my mother and I, we go to Carolina Beach, and dad liked to get up early in the morning, collect seashells and that sort of thing. And so we're there on the beach, and dad gives us a warning. He says, the undertow's really strong this morning. I checked the weather, read the paper. The time that we're going to be out here, the undertow is going to be very, very strong. And he also knew that my mother and I, neither one could swim. So he gave us direction. He gave us a command. And he said, I want you to stand and play in the water and have fun, but you're to face the beach. You're to see how deep you're getting into the water. Don't be looking out the ocean. It's deceptive. You won't realize how far you are off from the beach. So as we started playing and this or that, I began to fight my mom because the waves were just dumping over me, just pushing me down, pushing me down. And I realized at some point in it that we were starting to drown and we were getting out way too far. I had a need. I had a need to be saved. So my father jumps in and he swims out to my mother and I and we're kind of wrestling and tussling. And we're about halfway out the pier at Carolina Beach and dad grabs me and mama says, take Johnny, get him in. And so dad takes me and he brings me up on the, on the beach and I'm coughing and trying to get my wits about what's going on. I look out, and Mom's almost at the end of the pier, and Dad jumps back in. He goes after her. This is a 66-year-old man. So he gets out there, and he's got a hold of my mom. He can't really bring her in because that undertow really strong. And there's one gentleman that's way down the beach. We didn't see him, but he jumps in, and he goes out there and helps my dad, and together... Him and my dad brought my mom in. And as soon as, very quickly, as soon as he realized that mom was okay, he turned around to the man to ask him, because that was time when you didn't have waterproof watches. You know, if he damaged a watch, if he could, you know, pay him for anything, thank him for helping. And he wasn't there. We've often believed that that was an angel that came to help. But there was a warning. There was a command. There was a need. And in this case, there was a savior. Now, this is a human example, a saving for a physical time at a physical place, temporary. Did that mean I wasn't going to die at some other time? Absolutely not. It just meant for that moment in time that I was saved. About a year after that, we're at a revival. My dad believed in that day and time, we lived out in the country, that if any church sent word to our church that there was having a revival, we had to go. Not just ours, we went to all of them around. So we went to a Free Will Baptist church, early 70s, and you can look this, this film up. But there was a film called, If the Footman Tire You, What Will the Horses Do? And it was based off of Scripture in Jeremiah, chapter 12, verse 5. This movie was the Christian version of Red Dawn. In this movie, communists take over. It starts out, they're in a church. Communists, they come in and they start taking everybody out and, and assassinating them. I mean, it, it is just like the worst thing that you can ever imagine. And between that and a military family upbringing, it's no reason that I'm a, a prepper. I've been a prepper as long as I can remember, always prepared for emergencies. And I'd encourage you to do the same thing. I'll, I'll throw this little plug in for this. 
if you've ever played a sport, if you've ever started a new job, there's a bit of uneasiness when you're not prepared for something. But if you've practiced something over and over and over in your head, if you're law enforcement and you've practiced having to take somebody down with a weapon, or a firefighter and you've practiced how to pull that hose and charge that line, there's a familiarity that takes away some of that uneasiness by being prepared. And as Christians, we're called to be prepared. We're to look to the sky and wait for the second coming. So here I gave you two testimonies. One, a physical saving, and the other, a spiritual saving. With that, if you would, turn with me to Romans chapter 3. This is God's inerrant word. God spoke through over 40 different men of God. There is no error in this Bible. And we're going to read from God's word. If you turn to Romans chapter 3, we're going to start at verse 20. But in my Bible, it's got some descriptions for paragraphs, some subsets. And starting in verse 9 through verse 20, it says the final verdict. The whole world is guilty before God. And we're going to read that in the scripture. But then it also says, starting in verse 21, going on into chapter 5, justification by faith in Christ. So those two concepts, that the whole world's guilty before God and that we're justified by faith in Christ, those are the two broad-stretching themes that we're going to look at here this morning. Let's start reading. Follow along with me, if you will. Romans chapter 3, verse 20 through 28. It says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law... There shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. May the Lord add to the understanding of his scripture. You see, just like the example of that, that I shared with you, there's a need to be saved. The Bible tells us in Genesis that God created the heavens and the earth and he put all things in place and he set them. The rules of science and math, the rules of all things, God put them in place. And God, just like my father, gave me a, a warning. He said, enjoy to Adam and Eve. He said, enjoy everything, but eat not of this one tree, lest you'll surely die. So when sin entered in, so did that relationship between mankind and God. It was abruptly halted. Sin cannot be before a holy God. And God, even in Genesis, started to show through his story, his story to us, what his plans were, that he was going to send a savior. He was going to send his son. So because of sin, we're undone. We read here that all have sinned and all have come short of the glory of God. It doesn't say some, it doesn't say most. It says all. The Bible tells us that through 
one man through Adam, the sin of the world fell on all of us. It's in our DNA. It's in our makeup. So likewise, through one, through Jesus Christ, comes a Savior, comes salvation through faith and grace. So there has to be a reason. We need to be saved. Now, I shared with you that physically I was drowning. You could put that in a spiritual understanding. You could say, okay, as a sinner, we all sinned and we all come short of the glory of God. I was drowning in a sea of sin, just like we all were. That's a universal experience. It's not something that just I share or Derek shares or Vicky shares. We all share that. We also all share that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, that he would offer us a gift of salvation. So we're all offered that same gift. The choice and the free will comes through the part of what are we going to do with that gift? Are we going to accept it? Are we going to take it? What are we going to do? So let's break down these verses that we read this morning. Let's look first at verse 20. And if you're taking notes, I'd encourage you to write this down. Number one, the law defines sin. The law defines sin. And we say over and over, the law does not save us, but it does define sin. Let's look at verse 20. It says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. What does it say there? The law can't justify you. The law can't make you right. The law can't save you. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. See, the law was held up. It was put together. It's almost like a mirror. We look in that mirror, we see our faults. We see those crow's uh, feet, those little wrinkles around our eyes and wrinkles in our forehead. And we see all the imperfections. And that's what the law did. It was a self-assessment on where we live in a godly life. You know, Paul wrestled with the apostles. And that also goes back, plugging again, Brother Danny, on Wednesday night for Galatians. But there was questions in the early church about what are we going to do? And some of the Judaizers were saying, well, to become a Christian, you've first got to be a Jew, you got to be circumcised, you got to follow the law. And Paul said, no, 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 none of those things, none of those things will save you. Following the law won't save you. Being circumcised won't save you. All the things that Brother Danny has talked about, being a good moral person won't save you. Doing good works won't save you. Having grandparents that laid the foundation of this church won't save you. None of those things will save you. In the situation that I gave you where my mother and I were soon to perish in the Atlantic Ocean. There could have been a number of things that could have happened. Could have been a, somebody in a, a, a kayak come by or a boat. Somebody could have called 911. There was a lot of different ways that we could have been saved, perhaps. But the Bible tells us over and over, there's only one way that you can be saved. So first, the law defines sin. It tells us what sin is. And sin is anything that is counter to God. Not following his law. Not following his will. Sin. Second, the law declares that all men are sinners. Let's read verses 21 through 23 in, in detail. So he just got through saying, the law is the knowledge of sin. Now in verse 21 he says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Think about that for a minute. The righteousness of God, all the creation of God, everything, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Verse 22 says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. You think about that foreshadowing, that typing of Jesus, when Abraham 
went up on the mountaintop and at the direction of God was prepared to kill his own son, Isaac. And yet, a ram was provided. You look at that in the Old Testament and the law, and the law said that there's going to be offerings that you've got to give at the temple for sin. And on the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur, for the nation, they would bring together an unblemished lamb. And that lamb would be sacrificed, that blood would be shed for the covering of sin for a period. But when Jesus Christ died, it says that the veil of the temple was rent from heaven to earth. That the law was done away with it. Now there was no reason for sacrificing of lambs or animals because Jesus Christ, praise God, he was the lamb. He was the lamb that was slain and it was brought back to life. In him was given death, resurrection, and life for all eternity, for all that believe in him. But then here in verse 23, what we just read a minute ago, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have that same problem. We're dying. We're dead to God. We have no relationship with him and we're undone. But there's hope. Next, I want you to understand, number three, that the law is deficient to save. The law is deficient to save. Number one, the law defines sin. Number two, the law declares all men to be sinners. And number three, the law is deficient to save. Let's read 24 through 26. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus being justified, being made right, being made righteous with God. How does it say this happened? Being justified freely, we're no longer in chains and bondage, by his grace, grace is that gift that is given to us when we believe in Jesus Christ, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See, we were lost and undone and dying, and we couldn't pay our own debt, but there was a Redeemer, And his name is Jesus Christ. And he bought our sins. He paid for our sins. He fulfilled that sin debt and placed us righteous in front of his father. He's our advocate. Verse 25 said, Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Remember we talked about that started back in the book of Genesis. After Adam and Eve were found sinners, And God understood that they had ate of that tree and the serpent was there. God spoke to the serpent and he explained then that he would, that that serpent, that the Satan, he may get the heel of Jesus, the one that's going to come, but that the Savior would crush his head. And as we read in the back of the Bible, we read in the book of the Revelation, we see that That great battle of Armageddon is going to come. That Satan is going to be loose for a period of time, but then he's going to be bound and he's going to be thrown with all his angels and all those that have followed him into an eternal lake of hell, of burning fire. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. The Bible tells us that God throws our sins when we call on him, when we recognize that we're a sinner and we're lost and undone, and we admit the A from the ABCs. We admit that we're a sinner. And then B, we believe, and we call on the name of Jesus Christ, and we put our faith in him, and we repent and turn from our sins. And then C, that we confess. We confess publicly. We confess to our friends, we confess to our family, to our co-workers, to everyone we come in contact with, we give our testimony of what God's done for us in our life. When you put those ABCs together, we are restored in the eyes of God. Now, it doesn't make sense to us. I mean, I, I may still hold uh, a vendetta against somebody that took my lunch money in first grade. But God says, I don't remember that stuff anymore. It's gone. It's done. See, God's ways are much higher than our ways, and we can't understand. 
But we do have to believe. And when God says it, it's done. He says, confess it, turn away from it, don't do it again. It's a done deal. We don't have to talk about it again. But then verse 26, he says, to declare, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. You see, if all praying people in America and around the world called on the name of Jesus boldly and said, this coronavirus has no hold over me. Whatever happens to me in this earthly body really doesn't matter because I got a home. I'm a sojourner. I'm just coming through this world for a short period of time. But I've got a home in heaven. How do I know that? Because Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, then I'm going to come again. And I'm going to receive you so that you can be with me. So the law, we're seeing what the law can do, what the law does, and what the law has no effect on. The law cannot save you. All these things that we talked about can't save you. But then the fourth thing, and this is the last point of the lesson, the law denies men the right to pride in their salvation. The law denies men the right to pride in their salvation. You see, we all want to try to tell ourselves that we're doing good things, that we're doing good works, that we're out here while this coronavirus is running around, that we're taking care of our elderly parents or, or you know, we're just out here, out and about, and we're not letting this thing concern us. We're helping others in any way that we can. And those things are good, and they're Christian. But let's read verses 27 and 28. It says, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Again, Paul and Peter. And Paul, when he came to Jerusalem and they had the uh, conference and were setting up the, the matters of the early church, there were many that said to Paul, well, Paul was a persecutor of the church, and Paul wasn't really a disciple, and how is Paul going to know all these things? But the Holy Spirit conferred on Paul so that he knew all things, so that when he was in the same room with the apostles, they could neither add or take away anything because the Holy Spirit had told him everything he needed to know, everything about Jesus, everything about his life here on earth, everything past, present, and future. The Holy Spirit gave it to Paul. So it says we can't brag on anything because we didn't do anything. The only thing that possibly we could brag about is that we had sense enough to understand that we were lost and undone, and rather than rely on ourselves, we said, Lord, I'm undone. I can't fix it. I mean, I've stepped off into something that I can't get out of, but I need you. I believe in you. I believe in your word. As I look around this world, the mountains, the sky, the water, the animals, they cry out to me that there is a God, that there is a creator. And if there's a creator, I'm his creation. And he wants a relationship with me, and I need so desperately a relationship with him. So I hope this morning, as you understand about salvation, maybe a little bit more than perhaps you did before this, understand, number one, that we are all lost and undone. If you've never asked Jesus Christ into your life, if there's never been a time that you can point to that either through inspiration or desperation, that's the only way people change. You were either inspired or you were desperate. You were at rock's bottom low. And you got on your knees and you got in your prayer closet or wherever you were. And you cried out, Lord Jesus, if you're real, make yourself known to me. I ask you today to take my life, to change this life that I've been living. I know that the things I'm doing are not healthy. I know they're not good for me. And I know there's a better way, but I don't know how to get there, God. If there's never been a time that you called on Jesus to save you, today is the day of salvation. Confess your sins. God already knows them. He knows everything about us. But he wants you to understand 
through confession that you understand what you've been doing is wrong. Wrong in action, wrong in thoughts, sometimes wrong in the things that we don't do. But this verse is there this morning tell us, if you want to know what sin is, look at the law, because all these laws will tell you. If I'm out here driving up and down the highway, we've got the same thing. We've got a law, and it says posted 55. And there's repercussions. If you go over 55, perhaps you'll get a ticket, maybe get in a wreck, maybe lose your life. But there's also people that police up on these things to make sure that we're trying to do the right thing. Does that mean that we don't ever go five or ten over? Sure we do. Sometimes maybe we don't get caught, but sometimes maybe we do. But the law is given not to take our fun away. It's given to protect us, to help us. The Bible says that God wishes the best for us. He wants us to live a good and holy life with him. All these things that we talk about the law, law shows us what sin looks like. But only one, only Jesus Christ can show us what salvation looks like. It's frustrating as a Christian sometimes to watch TV, news, social media, to hear the things that are put out in our school systems, to hear the things that are put out in our colleges. You know, I, I graduated uh, at Appalachian in 86 and, and an MBA in 90, and I know the things that were being put out then. And that's decades away from what's going on now. I can only imagine the type of nonsense that's being told in schools. That there's many ways. A lot of people look to Oprah Winfrey, and she says, oh, there's many ways to God. The Bible, what did I say? This is the inerrant word of God. God inspired his instruction book to all of us. And he tells us that there's only one way. There's only one name above, in, and beneath heaven in which we can be saved, and that's the name of Jesus Christ. Understand that we all are in need of saving. We're all separated, and we're going to die a sinner's death and spend eternity in hell unless we change, confess, and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But also understand that there is a Savior. He loves you. He wants to draw you to him. He does that through the Holy Spirit. No one can on their own just up and say, hey, I want to be saved. It doesn't work that way. DNA is made up of all the, the things from years past, from our ancestors. And in our DNA is sin. And the Bible tells us there is nothing that would draw us to God. We wouldn't go seeking God. If you're thinking today, if you're watching today, and you've got questions about eternity, if you've got questions about the one called Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is putting that thought there. The Holy Spirit is coaxing that curiosity because there's nothing in us that would bring us to seek out God. So I'll close with this. If you haven't made a decision for Jesus Christ, there's no better time than right now. While all this fear-mongering is going on and everybody's concerned and hoarding up groceries and all the craziness that's going on, every time that God or one of his messengers encounters man, what's the first thing that he always says? Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Be not afraid of a coronavirus. Be not afraid. But he does say, be not afraid of the one that can take your fleshly body, but be afraid of the one that can take your soul. Church family, I ask you to prepare for the days to come. To use this time, you're either going to come out the other side of this crisis stronger or weaker. Spend it in the scripture. Spend it on your knees in prayer. Build up your relationship, your trust, your faith in God. And when he brings you out the other side, then you got a story to tell the future generations on what God did for you during this pandemic outbreak. May the Lord be with you. May you get blessings from this. And until next time, amen.
Get me?